The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by Squarespace. Start building your website today at squarespace.com. Use the offer code CANDIDFRAME at checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. This is Ibadi X, and this is The Candid Frame. Over the past 10 years, I've had the honor and the pleasure to speak to some wonderful photographers, many of whom I've had the opportunity to spend time with and even work with. Spending time with people who inspire me on a regular basis is one of the greatest blessings I have in my life, and I'm so happy that I can often share some of these conversations with you. One of these people is certainly Dan Winters. Dan is undoubtedly one of the world's best living photographers. Many of his portraits and illustrations have not only become iconic, but they've also inspired generations of photographers. Unlike most photo books out there, His manages to always go up in value and are eagerly sought after by photographers and fans of photography. His latest book, The Grey Ghost, The New York City Photographs, will no doubt meet with similar success. In this book, Dan shares work that he produced over decades in the Big Apple, beginning with his early years in the city when he worked as a photo assistant, until today when he is one of the most sought-after photographers in the world. Unlike the portrait images that he is popularly known for, these might be described as street photography, but as you'll hear Dan say, he prefers to describe the work as more public photography. But by any definition, it's a great opportunity to discover another intriguing facet of a very talented and generous man. If you've not heard our two previous conversations with Dan, we'll include links to them in our show notes. But for now, enjoy our latest sit-down with Dan Winters. Well, Dan, welcome to The Candid Frame. As always, it's always a pleasure to, to sit down and, and talk with you. I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to you about your your latest book, because I remember us talking about this when we met in Austin so, you know, several years back. It revolves around your fascination with New York over a period of time. Tell us about who you were when you first came to the city, Uh, because you were in California initially, and then you made the move to New York. Tell us about who you were and where you were at, not only as a a photographer, but as a young man. Well, that's actually a really good question. So I, I had come back from Munich. I was living in Munich for two years, and I came back, and I was hired as a general assignment photographer for the Thousand Oaks News Chronicle, which was a 35,000 daily newspaper in Ventura County. And we had six six or seven staffers and a full-time photo editor, full-time lab tech. So it was a pretty great job. And when I was in Munich, I was shooting on the street a lot, and I was really learning how to see things, I feel. You know, it was a really formative time for me, you know, like the idea that, you know, I had this <clears throat> sort of preoccupation with light for the first time and seeing how light could profoundly affect what a scene was and could affect the photograph. And I don't think I'd had as profound a realization as I had in the city at that time. So I got back and I was working at the newspaper for a couple of years. I went to the Eddie Adams workshop, which I've told this story before, and uh, ended up in New York uh, working for Chris Callis full-time. So I went from being a general assignment photographer, wide-eyed, absolutely like ready to take on the world, doing things my way, you know, shooting all 35 black and white, medium format black and white, just really looking at sort of the giants of the medium at that time uh, that were on my radar at that time. Frank, Metzger, Callahan, Papa George, Meyerowitz, Winogrand, certainly, Friedlander, and really trying to, you know, Cartier-Bresson, trying to kind of emulate that, but like, how am I adding to this? You know, it's like, that's always the challenge in photography, I feel like, is, you know, the medium is so rich and so well-examined 
that I feel it's our responsibility as photographers to try to make some sort of contribution and to try to define what that is. And, you know, some people make profound contributions and some people make more subtle contributions. But I would argue that if you're looking at the medium and looking to kind of assess where you could make a contribution, you know, you'll be successful at it. So working full time after shooting for four years ostensibly for myself, I, you know, I, I wasn't shooting. I was assisting a very successful commercial photographer. I gave him a one-year commitment. And so this kind of, you know, baptism by fire to a degree. I really didn't know what I was doing as a first assistant for a commercial photographer, having been a photojournalist for all that time. You know, I didn't know how the strobe packs worked and I wasn't familiar with studio practices, et cetera. But, you know, I quickly kind of worked that out and assimilated. But I was really feeling like my creative flow and my, you know, my sort of eye needed to be nurtured and fed. And so I spent all my free time. I was single. I had a bicycle. I was 25. All my free time riding around the city and photographing. And I would go out to Staten Island or I'd go up the Empire State Building or I'd go kind of in public areas where people were busy and photography was actually taking place. So the camera would go unnoticed and, uh, and photographing. And so this body of work started to really mature as this period of four years when I lived in the city, you know, elapsed. I felt at the end I had created quite a big body of work of uh, just, you know, street photography. And I use the term street photography only. I, I like the term public photography better, I think. I think street photography connotes like a certain fleeting moment, potentially, like maybe Brisson moment of, of you know, this sort of convergence of elements. And mm-hmm. while I do feel like a lot of the work I create has a fleeting convergence, you know, it definitely feels like it works a little bit outside of the typical sort of, you know, understood kind of meaning of the genre. So that's kind of where that went. And then it just, over the years, I go to New York for work quite often. So I just shoot there when I go. And, and you know, I've always looked at my work as, you know, multiple bodies of work happening kind of concurrently. And, you know, I'm very good at like compartmentalizing where things go. So when I'm shooting a certain way or a certain subject, I kind of, in my mind, on the checklist, kind of identify it as, okay, that's a part of this body of work or that's a part of this body of work. So I just keep feeding kind of the New York body of work when I was there. And when I did Road to Seeing, which you helped me on, I did a chapter on New York and I did a big chapter on street photography. So I started digging through a bunch of the stuff that I had shot that I wanted to maybe use a couple images for the book and you know the uh the stuff really resonated with me i hadn't really looked at it in quite a long time so i thought you know that would probably be the next logical project after uh, road to seeing book project after road to seeing you know it's kind of interesting you know that you, you when you are, were out in the street during that period of time and you mentioned some really greats of of street photography um uh, just now but you you made the point of being able to sort of claim what you were doing in your own way and personalize it, but it, it can be kind of hard to get to that point for, for, for many. And I'm kind of wondering when you were sort of able to sort of, sort of shed the sort of common motifs of street photography as you were going out there on your bicycle and making photographs and get to the point where you were coming from a place that was really unique to who you were and who you were seeing when did that start gelling for you? When did you start recognizing that you were doing something that really was your own? There were there were a couple of photographers that that helped to steer me away from what I suppose you know the common vernacular would define as street photography. And one of them was Ray K. Metzger. One I would definitely say was Harry Callahan, and one I would say was uh, Matt Mahurin. And I think those three. You know, it's it's that old sort of argument about you can give 100 people a camera and you're going to get 100 different pictures of the same thing. And the idea that we're auteurs to a degree, I mean, we are, you know, it's our solitary enterprise to make the picture and to own it. And so I saw in Metzger someone shooting 
in the exact same scenario as, for example, someone like Evans could have shot or someone like Winogrand could have shot or even Callahan and seeing something that was so vastly different from what other people were producing that it had such a stamp of authorship on it. And so that informed me that, you know, this, you can really extract from any kind of given situation something that's like deeply personal and deeply, you know, your own. That was a real inspiration. Matt Mahurin was another photographer that I, I'd known him for many, many years. He and I went to the same school. We had the same instructor uh, who studied under Matt Skur and Callahan, actually, in the 50s at the Art Institute in Chicago. It was the same thing. You know, Matt would shoot on the street in Paris or Dublin or New York, and the photographs looked vastly different from anything I'd seen, even though I knew full well there was nothing he was doing or there's nothing about where he was to a large extent that was informing the photograph other than his ability to see the the scene within the scene, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That was really inspirational to me. He he did a book in 1980, I want to say 86, maybe it was 84 with Twin Palms. At that time, it was 12 Trees Press. And uh, that really, that book really affected me. Uh, Metzger's work in the Chicago Loop really, really affected me. And then obviously Callahan's street work, which defies the genre completely, really kind of changed the way. And that was probably the earliest, the earliest sort of exposure I had to, to uh, you know, Frank's work. And I'd say Frank's work and probably to a degree, Winogrand's work is a real gut, kind of gut photography, you know, and it feels fleeting and it feels very raw. And, you know, I, th I think to a degree, those two really help to shape kind of how we perceive the genre, you know. I mean, I've often said that if you said, if I asked someone what they were shooting and they told me what the materials they were using were, you know, I'm using tri -X, with a 35 millimeter platform with a 50 millimeter lens, you have a general idea aesthetically as what those materials are going to render. But with regards to content, the sky's the limit, you know? So you look at Friedlander shooting with plus X with a Leica and you look at Winogrand shooting with tri -X with a Leica on the same street. There's actually a photograph I saw. Who was that? It was Friedlander and Winogrand, maybe, or Friedlander and Eggleston. Friedlander and Winogrand, I think, were literally shooting on the same block, and there's a photograph of them both photographing that I found completely fascinating, mm -hmm. that they're together kind of shooting. The community was so much smaller then, you know. Yeah. I mean, it was very small. I talked to Eggleston about, about the photo community in the 60s, and they were all friends. You know, they all hung out. Arbus, like all of them, they all hung out together, and they were friends. And, you know, uh, Evans and Evans and Kristen Berry went to Hale County together and shot. And, like, all, you know, it was kind of more communal, I think, now. It's just such a huge market now, and everybody's, like, scratching to get somewhere. And it's just very, very, very different. Even when I started magazines it's a very different climate now than it was in the 80s you know it's a it was a much smaller world but you know it's the nature of things were you, were you making prints and then taking them taking taking them to the photographers that you mentioned and getting their, their feedback what tell me about the whole process in terms of deciding you know which pictures you wanted to print and 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 you know the whole process of showing them to someone and getting their feedback it's actually funny. Um, I was thinking about that the other day because I remember printing uh, several. I started this series, and several of the images that are in Grey Ghost are from a series I was working on specifically on the Staten Island Ferry. And basically, what I would do is I'd ride my do my uh, bicycle down to the dock, and then I would board the ferry and um, lock up my bike and just cruise the decks and shoot on the way over and then on the way back and the way over and the way back. And I would just kind of walk around in the fresh air and it was wonderful and inspirational and beautiful. You get this beautiful view of, you know, the Southern tip of Manhattan and Empire State Building, it's our Statue of Liberty, et cetera. So I got really into this, you know, making the, these photographs and I remember printing them six by six they were square I printed them six inch by six inches on Aptalure and I was using gold chloride and ammonium cyanide to 
tone them. So they had this beautiful, like split blue, warm tone. And I was varnishing them and, and like, really like they were precious. You know, I took a bunch of them to show Chris. So Chris is a commercial photographer doing huge ad work, very, very technical, very sort of almost inaccessible to anyone that didn't have a pretty vast knowledge of the medium and the equipment required to sort of carry out what he was doing. So he was a real specialist. So his take was more sort of like, what's that going to get me work-wise? And I, I think he was genuinely, you know, looking out for my best interests because my tenure there was probably coming up and, you know, I said I wanted to show him some work and it was kind of a big deal for me to like bring him in. And I think as a young photographer, we really haven't learned yet how to make ourselves vulnerable and how to get feedback and how to sort of put work out there. And, you know, giving feedback on work is a gentle process, ideally, you know, even sort of <clears throat> some of the work I've looked at, student work that I've, I've just cringed at, I usually try to find a kernel in there that is positive and hope to inspire rather than to dissuade, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, discouraging a young photographer because, you know, he's not there yet is potentially like, you know, playground bullying, you know? So, so I was really nervous about taking the work to, to Chris and showing them and, and he didn't really respond very well to it. You know, he thought that you know, there was no way I was going to get any work with this and no one was going to hire me to shoot this kind of work and I should do this and that. And I actually genuinely appreciated the feedback. And, I, you know, I took it to heart. Um, I felt like really strongly that I was on to something interesting, you know, unique to a degree. And that, that you know, his feedback was probably really accurate with regards to like what was commercially viable and I and I was grateful for it. He I showed Matt some work and Matt responded very differently from the way Chris responded only because I feel like Matt's motivation has always been like Matt does what Matt wants to do. He had great success doing that. I mean, he's a brilliant photographer, illustrator. So it was interesting to get those two. And that was right about the same time, I would say, as well. Because like I said, I think it was when I was coming up on my tenure with Chris. And I was really trying to sort of put a portfolio together. And so, you know, I mean, I think Chris's advice was shoot more portraits. You're good with portraits. Portraits are something that people need. Um, you know, you'll get work doing portrait work, et cetera. So that was great advice. You know, so his response to it was probably much more of a pragmatic response. Um, but no, I never, uh, I've never shown sort of any of the other, you know, I, I ran into Friedlander once on the street in New York, he was shooting and of course I didn't have my camera with me. And so he <clears throat> immediately asked me why I didn't have my camera with me. So <laughs> well, I'm just coming from the hardware store, you know, he's like, well, you know, you got to keep it with you all the time. It's not good. You know, where is it? It's at my apartment. It's not doing any good at your apartment kind of thing. So yeah, no, I think as photographers, oftentimes we live in a pretty vacuous world you know we don't uh, i think as a young photographer it is important to get feedback you know you have to be careful of who you're getting the feedback from and you know i know that there there are these uh, festivals where a lot of you know quote unquote industry professionals come down to evaluate you know where you're at and what you're doing but if you feel strongly about what you're doing you know, I, I would be mindful of who i showed the work to because you're going to get very different feedback from individuals that are coming from sort of disparate backgrounds, you know. So I, I, I've wondered about how that works, actually, you know, with regards to showing people work. You know, I think to a degree it's partially, you know, out of a desire to actually get work out of people that are reviewing work, and, and that's totally valid. But, uh, but anyway. You mentioned that, you know, um, sort of revisiting the, the ferry over and over again for mm -hmm. uh, a certain part of the, the work that you did here. How important was it to revisit certain locations in the city, not only in terms of what you're trying to do as a, as a photographer, but, but more so in terms of being able to sort of to sort of claim the city in your own way, if that makes any sense? You know, cause, cause New York is, is so huge and it's, it, and it's so many different things. And it's constantly changing and constantly flowing. And it's really sort of fascinating in that respect. But mm -hmm. for you, how did you, did revisiting spaces and in the way that you were doing sort of help you to sort of understand what your New York was? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, early on, it was, you know, for me, early on, it was trying to make sense of the place. 
And having a bicycle and a camera in New York is a very liberating thing. You know, I, I feel like I know the city, you know, below 23rd Street, <clears throat> which is kind of, you know, most of my activity in life when I lived there was below 23rd Street. I know the city incredibly well. And when you have a bicycle, you know the shortcuts and you know the one-way streets you can cut down against traffic and et cetera, et cetera. And I started just, I think what I started doing really early on was kind of activities. And they were almost like Staten Island Ferry seemed like a neat thing to do. So I rode that and it was really inspiring. And it was kind of experientially like a wonderful thing. You know, you have this wind blowing in your face and you know in the winter it's really cold and crisp and most people are inside of the ferry and in the summer and the spring and the fall they're outside on the deck and a lot of people are pointing at things and there are things going on and it's kind of this wonderful and once again you know a camera is not entirely out of place in an area that a tourist would be potentially like for example there's a picture in the book on top of the Empire State Building mm -hmm. of a woman looking kind of in the distance and a hand coming in with a finger pointing. You know, that picture was easy. It wasn't easy to make that picture. Those are difficult pictures to make, and I'm really proud of that ind individual image because I know how difficult those are to make where everything kind of comes together. You know, you could go or I could go on the Empire State Building and shoot and never really have any issues at all. I mean, with regards to you know, standing out or people kind of confronting me about what I'm doing. It was also public photography was considerably easier back then. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think people were nearly as suspicious of like, you know, potential like motivation, et cetera. But I found those places to be really inspiring because it was a kind of a concentrated area of wonder. You know, there were people that were kind of in awe of where they were, both on the ferry and on the Empire State Building. And, and it was inspirational to photograph that for me. You know, I mean, I have a lot of pictures from both of those locations. And those are certainly only two of many, but of locations. But I, I do, I did love kind of the way that felt, you know, and I, I, I remember I had a very close friend, I still am close with, named Kevin Amer, who's a very talented photographer as well. And he and I both worked for Chris. He was Chris's darkroom tech. He and I would just spend the weekend shooting and then processing and printing. You know, we had access to Chris's darkroom and then I had a darkroom and Kevin had a darkroom. And uh, we would just shoot and then we'd run film and print and eat. And like, it was this great photo, kind of photo camp. You know, the weekends were sort of photo camp, you know. There was always photography involved, always, you know. I mean, it was like my entire life was around photography and that was a pretty special magical time you know i remember also understanding starting to understand what different i remember friedlander being one of those last kind of one of the last ones i sort of started to felt like i started to get you know friedlander and eggleston because mm -hmm. at first look some of the work feels very irreverent you know almost and uh and 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 tongue-in-cheek especially freelander he's got such a sense of humor you know but you start to look at the complexity of the composition and you look at you know where he's directing your eye and it's really this it's just so powerful you know and eggleston once again also it's very like it could be deemed as irreverent especially technically you know like flash on camera for the interior stuff very raw very sort of like shunning technique to a degree but succinct you know and really really kind of special and then some stuff that's obviously like much softer sort of you know i'd say papa george meyerwitz it's a much you know, Meyer, which is kind of a color extension of what Callahan was doing in the 50s and beautiful work, no question. Um, like kind of more easily digestible, I suppose, for people in the same way that I feel like a lot of photographers kind of come to photography through sort of like Ansel Adams and then Brisson. Um, and those guys make sense, you know, when you're looking at, it's like, wow, that's a beautiful scene. Wow, that's a beautiful moment, you know, and there's complexity there, but the complexity isn't what makes the photograph great. You know, the simplicity of the moment or the simplicity of the scene that's so beautifully realized technically. And I think that's a natural progression. And I think a natural progression of photographer is to like see how other people are seeing. And you don't immediately see that, you know, that takes time. It takes work. You know, you got to really look. So there were just things about the city and places in the city that like made sense to me from a pragmatic standpoint with regards to like photographing in a public space, you know. And then there's, you know, of course, a lot of stuff where it was just stop. You know, there's a photograph of uh, two 
transvestites on the Brooklyn Bridge with another guy all in the same outfit. And they're doing some, you know, they're like a downtown club clubbers kind of thing and their friend was like videotaping him up on the bridge like dancing around and I stopped my bike and stood there for a second and watched and literally didn't dismount I was on the bike I had my Roloflex around my neck which I always had a camera shot you know maybe six pictures and then just kind of rode on then you know years later I saw a picture of uh, RuPaul who's a transvestite celebrity like kind of talk show host i think or something i said well, i think that's the that's the same guy that was on the or gal that was on the bridge that day you know and i dug the film out and looked i'm like i'll be doggone you know so it was kind of <laughs> interesting so those are it was one of those gifts kind of like from the universe you know the photo gods were shining on me that day but you know you get those and you know that ticker tape parade for nelson mandela which i really love some of those pictures and empire state building or statue of liberty obviously i mean that's a kind of uh for someone that didn't grow up there that's such a beautiful kind of destination you know it's always one of those things where you talk to someone that's a native of the city and they haven't been to the statue of liberty since they were a little kid going on a school field trip kind of thing you know and here i am a 25 or 26 or 27 year old you know going repeatedly because i find it so spectacular and magical so that outsider perspective i think served me very well You've likely had the experience of visiting a website or blog on your smartphone or tablet and immediately felt feelings of frustration. Either the font was too small or just navigating the page was impossible. What might have been simple and easy on a computer was not user-friendly on a smaller screen. There have been numerous websites that I've completely given up on simply because it was impossible to experience it on my phone especially with my progressively worsening eyesight. But I'm so grateful that at least my website, The Candid Frames, looks great on any platform, and that's because Squarespace optimizes my text, images, and illustrations to look good on any platform. And I don't have to do any extra work in order to make that happen. It's all handled behind the scenes, and it works beautifully and flawlessly. It's great to know that there is one less thing that I have to worry about each week when I update the content of the site. But you should really try it out and see how beautiful and flexible your own website can be on Squarespace. Start your free trial today with no credit card required at squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code CANDIDFRAME to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. It's, you know, I was looking at, at the photographs in the book, and one of the things that sort of c- came across in several of the pictures is, and hopefully I can describe it in a way that makes sense, but it seemed like these were glimpses of stuff that were caught at the corner of your eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't stuff that was just like right s- straight in the middle that were obvious. It was just stuff that was almost like on the periphery mm-hmm. that you were able to see. And the compositions themselves sort of, sort of favor that because of the way that you use elements, say, in the foreground to cause, you know, sort of, to sort of obstruct certain portions of the frame so that you're actually glimpsing these things through, you know, uh, crowds of people or some other physical obstruction within the frame. And I was wondering, getting to the point where you are sort of conscious of that, where it wasn't just sort of an occasionally impulsive uh, thing that led to a photograph, but that allowed you to sort of be really conscious and aware of what you were doing with the frame each time. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And it's interesting because because that's such a long span uh, of work, when I look through the book, you know, those different times in my photographic path aren't represented chronologically. So I see stuff that pops up periodically, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember when I was doing that or I was doing that and I was experimenting with that or exploring that. And there is a time when I was doing, you know, I'd say, okay, I'm going to go into a crowd and shoot. And so I'd go into a crowd and I'd find someone that was in the distance and focus on them and use the foreground to kind of cause attention. There's a picture of a policeman's head 
on a barricade that's elevated one story above the street, and there's a giant black sort of out of focus blob on the left side of the frame. I was trying to create sort of like a positive negative space. It's a very sort of like deliberate, you know, I have that same picture with no foreground element and it just is lackluster with regards to how interesting it is without that big out of focus element in the foreground. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, that's one of those things where if I showed that to maybe let's say I showed that to a young photographer who looked at it, they might say like, well, why is there a big thing here that's a black out of focus shape? You know, why didn't you like move over? And, you know, these are so, they're such deliberate decisions and they're basically just like experimentation. You know, I saw a photograph by Jerome Liebling of a police officer and all it is, I don't want to bring it up on my computer right now because I don't want to cut us off. But if I remember correctly, it was a, a police officer's hat and face, or maybe just hat, and it was sharp, and it was in the distance, and there was foreground elements that were out of focus. And I remember seeing that in a book at Photographer's Place in probably 88, and I thought, wow, that's cool. I really, I'm, I'm intrigued by like what's in the foreground, but I love the idea that he's isolated this guy with up the field and this and that. And so I became kind of fascinated with that. Now, there's several shots in the book that are deliberately sort of using a foreground, background kind of focus thing. There's one of a, a blimp that's uh, on Staten Island Ferry where two guys are having a conversation. And there's a blimp in the background, really small, right in the dead center of the frame. And it's tack sharp. It says Fuji tape on it, which I kind of love now. But it says Fuji tape. And then there are like hands pointing and, you know, those sort of street shots. Like at the bus stop, there's that one woman that's kind of messing with her earring. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk to you about that because that image, about four-fifths of it is just black wall, except for the juxtaposition of a woman in sunglasses right at the edge of the wall. And then the other to the left of it, just a sliver is a street scene with with the girl that you just mentioned walking down the street past a bus Adjusting her ear. Uh -huh. I mean, that's by a, the bus. Stop. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I know. I mean, and that's once again, that's like straight up Callahan in term or Metzger in terms of like exposure. Uh, you know, that girls in bright sunlight, that entire wall was a, it was a black, first of all, black wall. And the entire scene that the girl's in is lit by direct sunlight, so F16. And then the wall is black, black and it's in shade. So it just went to black. But that was a, that's a real conscious decision, right? It's like, oh, if I expose for that, I'm not going to have any detail here at all. And it's just really kind of interesting, just like, you know. You know, Callahan said something that always has resonated with me. And he said, I make the kinds of pictures that I like to look at. And I think once we start looking at pictures and we look at photography and we look at our own lives and what we respond to emotionally, like if if, if an image or a practice or a discipline elicits, you know, an emotional response. I feel like that emotional response is our inner voice, you know, saying like, Hey, I'm over here or whatever it is, like, follow me. So, you know, if we're looking at stuff and we're responding to it, you know, it's, I think our responsibility as artists to sort of like at least look into it. And because I think out of that practice of looking at, you know, that one Liebling shot inspired me to do work that doesn't look like Liebling's work at all. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, there was a seed that was planted or there's a kernel of like, I can go down this path and I can adjust it. I can, I can, uh, I can explore this and it's all exploration, you know, and I think all of that work was very exploratory for me. You know, there was no end for that work that work was just being created just to create work you know there was no assignment there was no i had no responsibility with regards to anything there was no accountability for the work you know no one I, nothing so you know it, it, when you're purely sort of exploring your i guess your your victories and defeats are based on your own perception of what you're doing you know so i think do you think that the sort of the repetition of trying to sort of refine a particular technical approach, like your use of foreground or background or, or, or contrast in, in the ways that you described in these images, did that sort of help you get from doing it from a very sort of conscious technical way to get to the point you were, that you, it was more intuitive so that serendipity and chance could, could make its way into the shot and produce something that wasn't just repetitive or derivative of the work that you'd already seen? Yeah. I mean, 
the thing about working with black and white um, film, you know, it's incredibly forgiving and it's really easy to do and really easy to expose film. You know, I mean, you got to wear a meter, I wear a meter on my belt and you check the exposure. And if you're on the shady side of the street, you can walk for blocks and blocks and blocks and never have to worry about checking the exposure again. If it's an overcast day, you know, you can check it in like the brightest area. And in other words, like really honestly, Ideally, as a photographer, for technique isn't really a consideration, especially when you're working in a simple way. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, in theater, they talk about, you know, you practice it, you practice it, you practice it, you practice it, and then you forget it. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is that you've done it so many times, you don't really think about it. And, you know, for me, like, technique has always been, you know, I feel like I have a really solid understanding of technique to the most complex stuff and the most, and the simplest things, I would say definitely this stuff, you know, shooting with black and white on the street is very, very simple from a technical standpoint. And then the focus thing just became kind of a fascination, you know, it's, it's, it's easy, you know, I would just kind of get in a crowd and shoot and find someone to shoot and like allow, I felt like I was kind of making, uh, I was kind of amplifying sort of the experience of this like, smothering that the city can do to someone you know it can be swallowed up by this kind of like sea of of people and so that was kind of a way for me to try to try to show that but yeah i I would say definitely like as much of a sort of preoccupation as it was now having said all that you know i was making all the other pictures at the same time as well you know i wasn't necessarily just doing that i would look for opportunities where i felt like that would work well it's like oh this would this really works well i love the way this foreground is informing the background etc but you know there's other stuff that was just more definitely more straight just sort of like here's the subject but i do i do like your I did do like the analogy you used about you know the periphery you know while well i would i don't know certainly know whether it was peripheral um i do definitely think that i was in my mind i had a lot of resolve to try to make something that was interesting and not expected and i was really attempting to do that and not in a way that i feel like solicited sort of artifice you know Mm -hmm. it's from a general it was from a really it's like the over view and it was a real genuine gesture to like you know i'm not i'm not trying to make myself different i want to make something that i haven't seen or something that i really like and you know you start to make a couple of those pictures and you go and you know you respond to the, the you know respond to your own work ideally favorably like you know this picture really works well i love this i love what i did with this this is really cool and then you go back out and you make another one of those or you modify that or you, you know, attempt to sort of like elaborate on it. I think that's how the, you know, the process grows. I mean, we don't have a chance to do that as commercial photographers, really. You know, we, we go and we have brief periods of time sometimes to set up and to shoot. And, you know, sometimes we have lots of time to set up and shoot. And, you know, it varies. But, um, you know, it's compulsory always that we come back with an image. And we're usually working within the constraints of whatever the assignment is or the subject is. And just purely exploring is kind of like a really beautiful thing. I mean, I know a lot of photographers that would do things that, do testing you know they'd call it testing you know and they'd go out and test something and i never really did that i always just shot and kind of the shoot was my test you know i'd think through it in my head and go to the shoot and try it and you know i knew i had enough of a command of the photographic you know vernacular that i could make modifications on the fly if i needed to to get something that worked yeah i don't know i mean i like the idea of just going out and exploring which you know i think most of the work comes out of that a good nim- number of images in the book are of the iconic architecture that is New York. What was the challenge for you in trying to, you know, take an oft photograph subject as the architecture in New York and making it your own? When you take a look at the images, you know, what what, what did you see as some of the bigger challenges that you faced? Right off the bat, like Flatiron Building was one of those iconic images is that Steichen and Stieglitz both shot and I was bound and determined to like make a picture of it and you know their photographs are both much more kind of obtuse and I suppose the funny thing about those pictures if you know those two images is they're both shot from the uh, east side of the street of that that intersection of 5th and Broadway and 23rd Street they're shot 
from the east side sidewalk along uh, Broadway. You know, they're beautiful images. I mean, Stieglitz is, is really odd, very vertical crop, which I thought was kind of an interesting choice. You know, one shot that way, it's a very, very, very narrow. It's almost like a panorama that's up on end. And then Steichen's photograph is kind of the blue chip sort of flat iron image, and he did it in brome oil over platinum, and you think there's only a couple prints that exist. I think the definitive one is at MoMA. It's got a real blue. It's nighttime. You know, they're both experiencing, experimenting with atmospheric photography. Stieglitz is in the rain. To the point, you know, I wanted to make a photo of the flat iron building, and I think... I think sometimes there's a tendency that we have as photographers to try to see it differently and to try to make a picture that's less expected or not as expected or this or that. And and I do that as well because I think, you know, the idea of like sensibility and vision and the idea of seeing something uniquely is a big part of, you know, what makes the work stand out. Mm -hmm. But on the flat iron, I was like, okay, I'm shooting the flat iron like dead on in my gun sights. Like here's the flat iron, you know, and I did that intentionally. So what my take on the thing and my version of it was I wanted to do it in the best sort of most beautiful lighting conditions I could do it. And so I went and made several attempts at just getting this thing that felt like kind of almost like a magical moment in terms of like the way it felt and the light and this and that. So it's a very like, and then there's another version in the book of the flat iron that's made in 35 early, early 87 in the winter, a 35 vertical, really like dutched frame, which, which I don't normally do. And it's very fleeting feeling. There's like a, one of the smoke, a little steam stack in the street, like spewing steam. And, you know, I, I, put that on the book opposite of a, a very similar composition to the Williamsburg Savings Bank, which is in Brooklyn, tallest four-faced clock tower in the world. And so that's another version of it. And if that, that version of it is probably more interesting, like from a, from a sort of like photographic standpoint in terms of it being dynamic. And, but the one straight on, like, I just love that picture. You know, it's just so like, here it is. Here's the flat iron building. There you go. You know, it's not anything, it's not hiding behind anything. It's just like, here you go. So there's something beautiful about that. And then Statue of Liberty is completely different, right? The Statue of Liberty, all the pictures are totally abstract. You know, there's like the spike of a crown and there's like, you know, a shot from the parapet where you only see the crown and the arm. You don't even see the statue. There's the shot inside the crown where you see the windows. There's the shot from inside the crown where you see the arm and the torch, but you don't really... No one ever knows what it is until I tell them what it is. And then there's the, the shot of the Statue of Liberty through the little uh, hole in the side of mm-hmm. the ferry where it's obscured by a piece of steel bar stock and there's a guy's arm that's out of focus. And so there's a whole, I would say the you know, the Empire State Building, there are a couple shots where you really can tell like that's what that is, you know. And I think those are, for me, were kind of my boyhood icons of what New York was as well. You know, it's like, oh, the Statue of Liberty and the Empire State Building and, you know, the Flatiron certainly later on once I started studying photography. I think I learned about the Flatiron actually through sort of Steichen's photo of it, to be honest with you, because I'd never even been to New York uh, until the workshop. So, so that was uh that was kind of interesting, but yeah, from an architectural standpoint, you know, there's there's uh, definitely some blue chip stuff in there that's been interpreted, and some more abstractly than others. But yeah, I guess I guess when you learn about a place through this is interesting because this is a photographic phenomenon, right? You learn about a place through photography. So as a kid, you know, you see pictures of the Chrysler Building, you see pictures of the Empire State Building, you see pictures of the Statue of Liberty, you see pictures of Times Square, about, of the bustle um, on, you know, in financial district. And that place sort of becomes what those pictures are. And so if, if I, before I'd moved to New York or was ever in New York, visiting New York, I had a construct of what New York was based on this photographic experience and that's not necessarily photographic experience it's also film experience but it's you know it's what i was it was sort of information that i had stored that meant what this is what new york is so to a certain degree i would say that when i went to new york to interpret new york i gravitated towards things i knew 
New York to be from probably childhood. You know, the nuance that's in some of the pictures is maybe more, is less pronounced in others. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's obvious, like, oh, the Statue of Liberty, that's an obvious uh, subject. It is an obvious subject. It's very emblematic of the city, but I can make it mine. You know, I can make that photograph mine in Statue of Liberty. Now, I don't think there are people like cruising around Statue of Liberty shooting too much. At the time, I found it totally fascinating. You know, I loved it. It just meant to me, it meant sort of New York, you know. How does working on the street where it's, where it's completely unpredictable, where it's almost trying to make order of chaos, how does that kind of work lead and influence the kind of work that you do in the studio when you're doing portraits where you're largely in control of everything? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where patience comes in. And I think that's where, you know, I was, my son and I work out a lot. And he said uh, to me, yeah, I mean, there's a period early on where we were going together, and I actually told them that I was I was getting uh, anxiety about even going because it was so difficult. And uh, he said, "You know what? Basically, working out is accepting suffering, mm. and once you can accept suffering, then you can get into a headspace." that allows you to kind of move forward. And that really resonated with me. And I've actually thought about that and applying that same sort of ethos to other aspects of my life. You know, we don't, we don't have any control over anything. You know, in the studio we do to a degree and much more so, you know. But the idea of shooting in the street, I mean, you have to be prepared for not coming back with anything. And accepting that that's just a part of what you're doing. And so just embrace the experience every time, you know. I mean, whenever I go to the city, I go walk around. And I'm actually, you know, happy to say that there are a few images in the book that are, you know, from last year and from this year. There's some, I think there's something, a couple of pictures in the book that are from this year, 2016, and the book just came out. They were right at the end. I think there's three or four, probably. So, you know, the idea that, you know, you go out, you get better at at it. You know, my son, it's one of the great sort of gifts, you know, our kids give back to us as a perspective that we may not possess, you know, and he's got a very analytical, mathematical, mathematic mind, and he studies aerospace engineering, and he is not interested in art or making art, or he's just really not interested at all in art. He and I had a conversation about it, and he said, the reason I don't like art is because I don't know when it's done. Uh, and he's coming to it from a mathematical standpoint where he has, you know, solved for X, right? So he's got mm -hmm. a problem and he knows that there's an answer. And the answer, by the way, is a correct answer. So he seeks that, right? And uh, he said, in art, I don't know when the problem's done. And I said, well, you know, it's never really done until you make a determination that it's done. But I will tell you that it becomes easier to identify when it's done the more you do it. Mm -hmm. And it becomes much more, I don't know if real is, is, is the right adjective, but it's, it's becomes, it's insolvent. You know, you, you know when you got it kind of thing. And, you know, I think the greatest joy as a photographer is going through work, you know, going through this work for the book was fantastic because it was 30 years of stuff I went through. Like I said, the lion's share was in this very brief, like, four-year period, three-, four-year period, and then smattering of stuff after that, which makes sense because, you know, I lived there for four years, and then after that I was, I was uh, not there anymore, L.A. and then Austin. What did you come to appreciate about yourself as a photographer as a result of working on this book? Well, to the point, I was making the idea of going through work that's, you know, where there's a lot of water under the bridge since you made it and actually seeing things that you saw then that you reacted to and then seeing things that weren't marked up on the contact sheets that were great surprises. You know, there are things there I've never, I never even like marked it back in the day and maybe I didn't see them consciously or I saw them and wasn't ready to react to them at the time. I don't know. So as a photographer, what I learned is uh, uh, that I learned that I had a lot of tenacity and that I had a lot of perseverance and that I worked very hard because I saw all this work, filling up binder after binder after 
or binder of negatives in, on the shelf and feeling a great sense of joy and accomplishment that I actually took the initiative with no, you know, there was, there was no constraints. There was also no kind of external motivation and created a bunch of work. And I was really satisfied with myself. And I think that's a really important part of it, you know, to feel good about, you know, what we did. And I feel like there are a few images in there that are, that are significant, you know, and I, I, I use that term very, very sparingly, but I do feel like, in my opinion, there are some images in there that are significant New York images, and I'm grateful that I was able to make them, you know. Did you find that there were any of the images that you, because of the, the leap in time from when you made it to, to when you were preparing the book, that led you to sort of reinterpret the image in terms of just the way it was rendered on, on paper? Uh, with regards to the way it was printed, you yeah, mean? Mm-hmm. like the way it looked. Um, what's interesting is when I actually, it's a good question because when I was doing the book and we were doing the show, my way of thinking was that I was trying to be as true to the image as I would have at the time I was shooting it. And so I thought about the paper I used and I, I shot, thought about the way I was thinking about the images. I pulled out vintage prints. I looked at, you know, sort of the tonal range I was working with, et cetera. And I tried to sort of replicate that time for me. So I I feel like I was probably really being true. And it's very simple. It wasn't any kind of complex. You know, I was doing more toning back then, but that gold chloride is so expensive. You know, I was really sparing with it. And I probably, if I were printing sort of a whole body of work, I probably just would have printed it on Ectolore. I think I was probably trying to be as, like I said, like, pretty true to where i was at the time yeah so what's next for you i know because i know you're always working on multiple projects at the same time but uh what's what's the next book for you well i the next one i'm i want to do actually is i had a, a really close friend brett uh kilrow passed away this year of cancer and uh he had four years uh he was struggling for four years with with his cancer and um i photographed him that entire time and uh all the way up until the end i was with him when he died it's a really beautiful like poetic kind of body of black and white work uh just of a man you know going through this ordeal and and all the medical treatments around it and then finally sort of his last you know days or last weeks in the hospital and, you know, surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something that I've kind of worked. I think I've made about 220 kind of work prints and I got to edit it down from there. And then, um, working on this, uh, working on this, um, book that, uh, you know, that, I collect negatives, you know, that big collection of negatives. And I want to do a book called uh, Anonymous Voice. And it's a book of, you know, images from my neg collection. And then we're doing a uh, periodical photographs too, uh, volume two. And then Scott Dadich, uh, Wired editor-in-chief who designed periodical photographs for me in 2009, is working on the new edition of that so those three books are kind of in the works right now um there's a few other ones as well i want to do i have a big book on uh chemograms that i've been working on for quite a long time that i think i got to put that to bed i mean i've printed i've done (laughs) hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them and i want to i want to get that to a point where so there's like four or five books in the works and then i do all that in my sort of spare time around you know, shooting assignment work. So it's a, it's a, it's a juggle, you know, it takes quite a long time. I mean, if I made a concerted effort to put a book together without having all that external stuff, you know, it could come together a lot quicker. My wife, my my final question is I ask each guest to recommend a photographer for our listeners to uh, discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that be and why? I'd actually say that, uh, I've been looking at a lot of Francis Bacon, the painter lately, Mm -hmm. and his lover was a photographer who did all the portrait sittings for Bacon's paintings. So when Bacon would, when Bacon would uh, do a portrait, he said he didn't ever want to paint from life because he felt like he would hurt his subject's feelings. So he had uh, his partner, go out and shoot the pictures. I'm kind of fascinated by it. There's a book, I can't remember what it is. It's like Francis Bacon on paper or something, but it's it's kind of all these photographs and then the paintings. So that 
to me it's I've found really interesting recently. So that, that's one one thing that I think uh, that I think uh, and also you know I've revisited Irving Penn recently. I did a talk at the National Portrait Gallery in conjunction with the opening of a very large Penn retrospective that they mounted. The curator of the exhibition took me and Kath on a private tour uh, before it opened. You know, it was just so wonderful to see that work on the walls. And uh, so it's, you know, he's always been my favorite portrait photographer. So it was kind of, uh, it was really invigorated by that. So I'd say that. I'd say those two. Okay. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time and just in your work and, and, and all that. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. All right. Thanks, brother. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks again to Dan Winters for sharing his time and his stories with The Candid Frame. If you are in the L.A. area and you want to see Dan's prints from his new book on exhibit, go to the Fahey Klein Gallery beginning September 8th. And on September 10th, he will be conducting an artist talk at the gallery beginning at 11 a.m. You can find out more by visiting fahekleingallery.com. Links for this will be on the TCF website and in the show notes. And to see more of Dan Winter's work, visit danwintersphoto.com. We'll also have a link to his new book, The Grey Ghost, in the show notes. If you want to purchase Dan's book, please use our affiliate link as it also helps our show. Remember that you can and do play a big role in introducing others to the work that we do here at The Candid Frame. Take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. Thanks to Robert J. Edwards from Australia and Bossman from the UK for their five-star reviews. You can also support the show by making a regular monthly contribution through Patreon. You can contribute amounts of $2, $5, $10 or more or anything in between on a monthly basis and help make a big difference to the work we do here at TCF. Visit patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or you'll find a link in the show notes and The Candid Frame website. I'd like to thank all the people who've recently contributed to the effort, including Lori Odover, David E. McClure Jr., and Danny Offer. You are helping us to make TCF even better. Thank you so much. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. Our senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at Incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.